Hey everybody, I'm Bill Calkins with Ball Tech On Demand and I'm excited to continue our month of short educational sessions intended to help you get prepared to grow your best crops ever for next spring. We've selected nine topics to cover this month, one for each Tuesday and Thursday, and hopefully you're taking some time to grab your phone, a tablet, your computer, and head to the break room with a bite to eat to hear from some experts on some of these diverse topics. Let's meet today's presenters who have actually been with us already to do a webinar on vegetative production that was very, very well received and got tons of downloads and views. So I'm really excited to welcome these guys back. So our first guest today is Dr. Will Healy, who's the senior technical manager at Ball and a frequently seen presenter for Ball Tech On Demand videos covering all sorts of different topics from specific crop production to watering to photo period and a whole lot more. So welcome Will and what's, uh, what challenges you've been helping growers with these days? Well, hey Bill, it's great to be on. You know, at this time of the year as we're heading through October, it's really tune up time. So we're kind of winding down the, fortunately this year has been a great mum year. I think everyone's kind of wondering, wish I had more. Um, and then the pansy season seems to be off and running. Um, fall seems to be pretty much chugging along. Poinsettias seem to be in pretty good shape. So, you know, it's been kind of quiet, but you know, we spend a lot of time getting these tech on demand um, documents um, out there so people can really start training their staff and not just doing firefighting, but planning ahead for the next year. So that's really what we're spending a lot of time right now on is getting prepped for next season. Absolutely, and you mentioned fall, man. From what I've been hearing out there, fall is going fantastic and mums are selling like crazy. So next we have Dr. Todd Cavins, who's also a technical manager with Ball and seems to have an encyclopedia of greenhouse production strategies in his head. Todd has a unique understanding of real world solutions and growers always appreciate his style and approach. So Todd, welcome. And any thoughts on what growers should be thinking about these days as they prepare for spring production? Hey, Bill, it's great to be here. So yeah, I'm actually, I've been helping a few growers out lately, still finishing up that poinsettia crop. So uh, we've been talking about height, man height management strategies. You know, some are needing to push, some are needing to slow down. But for spring, I'll echo what Will's saying, you know, kind of doing some cleanup right now, getting prepped for uh, next spring. And so definitely talking about those things, about getting prepared through sanitation practices, crop planning. I know there's a lot of growers that are reaching out to the sales reps out there and finding out which are the right crops for their for their particular needs. So uh, it's already, I, there's a lot of excitement in the air for spring. Uh, so really looking forward to see, seeing how it delivers. Excellent, excellent. So uh, real quick before we get started, I do wanna share just a couple <laughs> notes. All the videos and webinars from this entire series are going to be uh, collect, continue to be collected and posted at growtalks.com slash tech on demand. You can view them there. You can share them with your team. Uh, you're going to find plenty there already from vegetative production, like I mentioned, to watering, photo period with impatience, perennials, and calabricoa coming soon. Some logistics for this webinar. Uh, we will have the ability to ask questions of the panelists. Um, you can go ahead and post those in the Q&A box. Uh, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Potentially, the, the, the panelists, Will and Todd, will see those questions and answer them on the fly. But more than likely, I'm going to jump back in at the end and do my absolute best to ask all the questions that you post. But at the moment, we are on the clock. And I know that Will and Todd have a heck of a lot to cover. So. Uh, why don't you guys go ahead, share your screens, and uh, rock and roll on seed annual propagation and production. Okay, man, I see this. He's told us we have 30 minutes, Will. I don't think we could talk about opening up the seed package in 30 minutes, but uh, we're going to have to be rapid fire here. <laughs> well, you know, and that's one of the biggest problems when you know way too much. And, you know, I've killed off over the last 40 years probably more plugs than a lot of people have ever grown. Um, so we've learned a lot. We know a lot. And so, you know, I think what, what have we done, Todd? I think we've distilled this down to how you get started to be yeah. successful, right? Yeah, we, you know, the title here says seed propagation. Uh, we're, we're really distilling it down into let's get ready and let's get the seed germinated. So let's just hop right in and talk about what we need to do. Okay. Uh, yeah, first I'll start off uh, by saying, hey, let's talk about, you know, stage zero. We're not, we, we don't have the seeds in the cell yet, but 
we're talking about getting the facility ready. So sanitation, sanitizing your equipment, anything the plants or flats touch, we need to do this, you know, cards, benches, that kind of thing. But we have called out here specifically floors. Sanitizing your floor is critical. Even if you have solid concrete, those nooks and crannies, those are places where organic debris, soils build up. When you get that, you get algae, you get your fungus gnats, you get, that's where diseases are residing. So get a sanitation program and make the floors a critical part of that. Um, there's lots of different companies out there, several different companies out there that you can choose from. Uh, we really like uh, acidified soaps, cleaning and following up with quaternary ammoniums. Really good strategy to really control a lot of pest and disease problems all at once. Something else to think about, we've done some sanitation. All right, let's think about our input components. I know you're getting your soil ordered, you got your, your flats or your pots ordered, uh, but let's talk about that soil just a moment. You can, for those of you who have a screen in front of you, you see a picture of uh, two different trays, same seeds, different soils there. This was kind of one of those experimental soils. Um, so, you know, you need to do your homework. Don't start off the season with something you haven't done your homework with and trialed extensively. Uh, some of you may have seen some information that we've got some, uh, some of the European influence coming over into the U.S. when it comes to potting soils. You'll see things like black peat is pretty popular in seedling mixes coming from Europe. You know, it's, it's an older peat. It's broken down a little bit more. It holds more nutrients, uh, but it also holds more water. So do some practice with that. Make sure you are comfortable with that. As far as peat substitutions, again, referring back to this picture, uh, Compost like green waste compost, we're still not there yet for seed germination. So might hold off on that and go to a traditional mix or do some trialing out there, extensive trialing with any of the new components that are available. Some of them will be successful. We're just not ready to recommend them uh, from our perspective yet. Additives as well. Hey, yeah, microbial additives are really good uh, preventative measures. We see success with those as well. You might want to try those. You'll also, again, from the European influence, see some minerals being put into the potting soils, uh, kind of clay type mixtures. Uh, and those are, again, helping to bind the soil together, but also adding nutrient availability or, yeah, nutrient holding capacity. Talking about your water and your fertilizer, you know, those go hand in hand with your soil. What I want to encourage you if you is when we go into production for young plants, especially plugs and seedlings, um, you know, we really want to bring your alkalinity down and that's kind of like the dissolved limestone or the buffering capacity of your water. We want to bring that down low so we can use a high nitrate fertilizer that helps us keep tone, helps us keep our plant growth nice and toned. So Get, make sure you've done a recent alkalinity test. Make sure your acid injection is where you want it. Um, you know, think about the, you know, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are, of course, big nutrients. We need to make the plants grow big and tall. We need them in adequate amounts, but not too much. Um, you know, when we come to young plant production as well, if we just apply just enough out of a bag fertilizer for the right amount of nitrogen, we're probably not adding enough micronutrients. So you may think about an A tank and a B tank where you have the ability to add extra micronutrients, keeping your iron and manganese in the right ratios, one to one to a two to one ratio. And then plug production, we tend to be pretty wet. We have a lot of soil surface to a very small plant size. We need adequate calcium and boron because those are two critical nutrients that aren't taken up very well in the propagation um, conditions. Yeah, because right. Scott, uh, yeah, because Todd, these are just the sleepers that no one ever thinks about the soil and making sure you've got the right nutrients. You know that biofilm eating up all of your nutrients as it goes yeah. from the injector to the to the um, trays. So those are some of the sleepers. But let's talk about another sleeper that really basically affects yields. Oh yeah, carryover seed. Oh, um, you know. Fresh is best on seed. And if you're trying to use something from the previous year and it's been open, it may not be worth your time and effort um, because once you've opened that seed packet, you know, the clock starts ticking. So um, have a good storage facility, dry and cool for your seeds. Um, and again, if you've got it opened already, you know, that's probably okay to use throughout the season. If you seal it back up well, store it, keep it out of moisture. Uh, but from season to season, probably not a good strategy. So, um, but you know, if we, let's, let's just talk about uh, some of those problems that we invariably have time and again, and people just kind of shrug their so 
shoulders and go, oh yeah, this just happens. Well, you know, what we see here is probably the most common problem we see in a season where you have growers that basically we call this checkerboarding, where you've got wet and dry and you kind of go like, well, I don't know where it's coming from. Well, it's not starting out right at the very beginning. And you know, one of the problems that we run into is, is making sure we've got the soil uniformly moist when we go in the tray, because once you're in the tray, you are committed for life. And what kind of commitment do we have? I think Todd was one of the things we talked about, and hopefully I can get this one explained correctly, just to kind of put it in perspective. So if we take a look at it um, and we say, okay, if you were to just take a 512 tray and you were to not have the short row, you know, that's the, the short side of the tray, just one row that you don't have good performance because you didn't fill it right, it was the um, you, didn't, you didn't have dr you had dry soil, you didn't get it sown, you know, you have any problem just on that short road, just those tr cells that go across. In a 512 tray, that's 3.1% of the total tray yield. If you go and screw up a side, the long run, which is very common when you do flat filling, you don't get enough soil in the hopper and you don't do things right. So that basically if, if you kill off the entire long row, that's 6.3% of the total um, number of cells in that tray. If you start looking at basically screwing up the, the perimeter around the edge, you know, that's probably 10 plus percentage points of the total yield. So when you're trying to get increased yields, it's only the details that count. And that's really what we want you to be really thinking about. Are you really focusing the team on the details, getting the tray filled right with the right moisture on the soil and making it happen? Another really interesting problem people never think about is, you know, surprisingly, this is a precision operation getting the seed dead center in the middle of the cell germinated is not an art. It, there is a lot of science to it. Remember that you have to have a match set between the tray you're using, the drum that you're sowing the seed with, and the dibbler. Those three things work together to get the seed in the middle. You know, how often, um, Todd, have you seen where someone after, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years of that cedar, you know, they've gotten new trays because they got a good deal or they got a different, or and that the dibblers um, basically um, are slowly wearing out because they've used it a lot. You know, that dibble needs to be dead center in the middle. It can't be over on the edge because, you know, guess what? You, you, basically change the tray dimensions slightly and all of a sudden it all changes. What does that mean in the plant? Well, what you end up with is you end up with scooping so that you basically, I think those of you who've got are seeing this and I encourage everyone to um, download the um, PowerPoint presentation so they can see it. You end up with this little ridge along the um, one side and it's because the soil was scooped out. It's also, if you don't end up with it centered correctly, the, the center of the hole is not the same. What does that mean? Is that as it moves through, all of a sudden you have cave in of that scoop section and you have a wall fall over and bury the seed. So some of the seeds buried, some of it's not. And that's where you start running into lack of uniformity. That there aren't any bad seed, there's just late seeds. And of course the late seeds um, basically don't perform well. And of course, if you run a blowout, they're gone. So make sure that you get that soil filled uniformly. And you know, that checkerboard we saw early on, it really goes back to the flat filler itself. How are you fluffing the soil? A lot of people are using big bales and the big bales basically have got three water spouts that just basically drill water into as you get a wet spot surrounded by dry spots. The single best moisture um, handling to fill, just get the soil, um, uniformly moist, we have found is to get use a drum mixer. And that drum mixer has got some fogget nozzles in it that basically as the soil is turning and falling, it slowly starts um, getting wet uniformly through the whole soil ball. And that way you don't have um, caving in. In the picture that you have, you've got some cells that are full to the top and others that once they've moved around, they settle down because either it's bridging so it doesn't fill down or because it didn't have the right moisture and the soil collapsed. Those basically, you've got deep, you've got some with soil and some without, all don't work together to give you 100% usable seedling. So remember, make sure that all of the cells, not just some of them, but all the cells are filled correctly with the correct moisture to get the, a good uniform start. But you know, now that we got the trays filled, now, now where do we fail?
Todd. Yeah, so let's go, let's look at that sewing line. For those of you who are fortunate enough uh, to have an automated sewing line, such as uh, the ones we see here with the drum seater in it, let's talk about maintenance of that, you know, regular cleaning, okay? Um, especially when we're dealing with pelleted seed, it gets pretty dusty. You got vacuum sucking dust up into that drum. Uh, it gets clogged, you know, and uh, it creates problems, lack of uniformity, lack of uh, seed in the cell. So clean that drum, have a regular maintenance and, and cleaning process uh, for your team to follow. Um, let's talk about the mechanics of it. Um, vacuum and air pressure. Hey, we've got to get those tuned just right. We've got to have the right amount going in, get some regulators on there, get them tuned in. That can make a huge difference. We've seen problems with, you know, air compressor units cycling off and on, and then all of a sudden the seed uniformity starts to decline because it affected the, the suction or the vacuum on the drums themselves. So, you know, Keep in mind those kind of things. It's there's a mechanical component to it, absolutely. Take a look at your dibbler. Um, you know, Will, you showed a great picture there of that drum. Uh, get those adjusted. Make sure you've got the right dibbler to the right tray. Align all the sensors and and things like that, because this is what this is. Here's here's the proof. The proof is in the pudding. So if those of you are able to see a screen. You're seeing a seed flat with lots of seeds in it, seeds all around. We see where we have the X's there are missing, misses. You know, over on the right side of the picture, we've got a few misses there. But for the most part, we got nice clean uh, placement of the seed right in the center, which is also gonna help with automation of transplanting. So uh, it's real critical that we get all of those things tuned in and lined up. All right, so, oh, a little bit more covering a lot of us are doing covering on the sewing line right um, you can do it with different strategies probably vermiculite's the most popular here in north america there are a few folks that are using peat um, they like the fact that you know uh, it's all natural goes right on there blends in well um, it can be a little bit of challenging to get the peat out of the hopper uh, into a flat filler or a, a filler to uh, get it nice and uniform but it, i really like the the product or you don't have to cover it, I guess, depending on what the seed is, right? Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that later. Why do we cover seeds? But uh, the, the important thing here is the uniformity. If we don't get that cover uniform, we're gonna have problems. We're gonna have inconsistent. Will, you mentioned, you know, there's no, you know, not necessarily bad seeds, maybe some that are just kind of late. Um, and this uniform covering, holding that moisture in nice and nicely is uh, key to that. Um, this picture that we have up here now is a pretty common uh, vermiculite hopper on a seeding line, but notice how low the vermiculite content is in there. Uh, when you start to get that, you start to, when it gets really low, you lose the uniformity, uh, as in that picture on the bottom right where we have a big pile of vermiculite right in the middle of the plug flat, and that's not great. So one of the things you can do is make sure that hopper is filled to the appropriate level. We had a really, uh, um, a, knee grower that over in one of our operations in ball that he actually created a hopper and he's got a paddle on there and so he's got the uniformity in the hopper of his vermiculite all the time so nice and uniform that was his way to solve that problem so uniform seed covering critical critical and you know you say oh that doesn't matter but what he did is because he does really large runs and literally he was seeing a drop of about 15 points of uniform seedlings just as you went through and changed the uniformity of the um, vermiculite. So when it was very heavy, he had very good. And then as it got lighter, 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 he started losing. Um, and then someone would throw another bag of vermiculite in and bam, it'd go back up. And so that's why he built this filler. But let's talk about probably what I think is the single most success or failure indicator in is water management. It's the Absolutely. number one key to success. And it all starts on the flat filler or not flat filler, get the soil, and then it continues right straight through sowing operations. So when you get off of that line, that sowing line, either you're guaranteed maximum success or you're guaranteed nothing but trouble. If you take a look at our middle picture where you've got the water um, bars and they're randomly applying water, what does that mean? That means that you, some cells have got a lot of water, some cells have got a little bit of water. You know, the tray may have the right amount of water overall, but there's cells that are wet and cells that are dry very bad. Make sure that you clean that out, cleaning those bars out so that you've got a uniform curtain of water, best possible, and that you're getting your target weight. If you come off of the end of a seeding line and you don't have your target weights, which depending upon what you're trying to sow, 
pellet raw, somewhere between 900 and 1200 grams of water in that tray, whether you're in a 288 all the way down to a 512. If you don't have the right weight in that tray, the germination is not going to be uniform. You know, what some growers have done is they can get this bar and it um, has two um, outlets. So basically it, you can literally double the weight of that tray if that's important to make sure that you've got uniform weight in the tray. So key to success time and again, I see lack of uniformity, lack of germination, and it all goes back to you didn't get enough water in the, in the tray at the point where you sow it. So really go back and dial in and make sure and monitor it. Our grower operations basically make sure it's plus or minus 50 grams of the target. So if the target is 900 grams, it's between 850 and 950 grams all the time where they stop and slow the belt down, speed the belt up, um, or um, make sure that they've got everything working. So let's just make sure that we also think about the chamber. You know, do you have lights in it? Are you getting the lights? Are they drying them out? Do you have the dark? Is it staying wet? You do need to drop some moisture while you're in the chamber and you know, you've got the fog in there so that your weight in and weight out does not vary by more than 100 grams. Really important, otherwise you're not gonna get the best benefit out of your um, performance. So let's also talk a little bit about um, just getting that water out there uniformly. So one of the things that we see, on, if you've got the um, expensive seats, you can see that we're striping. And I put the stripes down on this picture so you can see where they're wet and dry cycles. And this was all in once the, the trays were laid down right after um, sowing, where they basically, they don't have the booms checked for output. You know, they all look like they're working, don't they, Todd, when you go and you see them? <laughs> but, yeah, until you see the racing stripes, that's for yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah, and then you all of a sudden you realize not. So how do you check that? Well, there's a product called the Red Ball Pattern Check. Just Google it, you can find one. Um, it's a big plate you can put down. It's used in um, agronomy to make sure that the booms are putting out the right amount of uniform amount of moisture. Key to success. Now is the time to do it, not when all of a sudden you're having that, why are these not germinating uniformly um, question. Then also, what about the um, whole thing with, um, with nozzles. Yeah, well, so for those of you using booms, I mean, it's a great economical way to do it, but you've really got to have a good inspection process for those nozzles. How long do they last? You know, it depends on your water quality. It really etches them out. So take, really dig into that. Make sure you got the proper overlap on there and that you've got the uniform water application. If you don't have the red ball pattern check, which we really like and have used a lot, you could simply go out and set out some trays and things like that and collect water. It's a little bit harder to measure and, and monitor though compared to that, but nozzle maintenance, really important. Uh, one of our tips that we wanted to share with you, you know, most nozzles out there are the fan type, type nozzles where you need to overlap a little bit, but we really like cone nozzles as well. And this is really critical for those seeds that get buried easily. Um, cone nozzle allows you to really gently apply a decent volume of water at one time. Uh, so they're a little bit more gentle, a little bit more uniform, a little less overlap issue um, or calculation in my opinion. So check out a cone nozzle if you haven't used those before on your boom. Then check out the volumes, you know, make sure your nozzles are matched correctly. Think about also edges, you know, a lot of times edges need a little bit more water volume out there. I've seen some folks double up nozzles or use a higher water volume nozzle on the edge, but it, the uniformity does go away after a while. So get all your pressures and, and flow and all that figured out and keep a good nozzle uh, maintenance program at top. Um, that's going to create some of those racing stripe problems we saw. Because For those of you that are going to, What's that, Will? Because, Todd, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of research in our premier lab um, on this. And isn't that one of the factors that we're seeing of some really nice um, improvements in overall performance? Absolutely. Getting uniform water onto the flat is critical. Knowing how much you're putting on at a given time, knowing what that target weight to water to and to dry down to are critical. So water management, water management, we're seeing that in the greenhouse and we're seeing it in our laboratory experiments as well. 
So, you know, one of the things we have to do is touch up edges, hand watering from time to time. There's no perfect system here. Um, you know, on the far right hand side, uh, you can see that there are some different nozzles. I mean, you can just look at the water patterns coming out of those different handheld nozzles. Uh, you want a uh, very uniform, very soft, so we're not compacting the soil. Um, that's what you want to look for. Don't just go grab the cheapest, hand, most handy nozzle. Make sure you've got the right one. Uh, the picture at the bottom left, you see, uh, took a picture here just after some, a grower did a touch up. Now we drew a red line, but you can see the difference in the foliage of foliage color there. So you always have to do a little bit of edge watering and plug production. You're just not going to get away from it. It's the way the air moves around the flat and the way it dries out. So, but you know, this is where, you know, maybe it is some of the art form here. You know, you've got to go back, you got to do it uniformly um, and with the right nozzle and, and watering nozzle on your water hose. So. So why don't you talk a little bit about stage one, um, you know, this sowing to radical emergence, what's important? Yeah, well, <laughs> let's, let's mention water again. Uh, so it's the seed hydration process, you know, the, the scientists called it imbibition, uh, but it's the germination process is all about water, water uptake. So Will, as you mentioned, the uniform uh, flat filling and hydration at that point, you mentioned when putting it into a uh, chamber, you know, um, not losing too much of, of, the, of the moisture in there. Um, but let's talk about another thing that tends to happen. You showed some lights on in a germination photo just a few minutes ago, and you showed some one wrapped in darkness. Well, here's what can happen if we don't control that. If you want it dark, make it dark. If you want it light, make it light. Because here in this picture of begonias, you can see the ones on the left. These came from the top of the carts, and you can see in that photo, there's light coming through. It can reach the top of those carts. Those flats on the left had light. The begonias germinated nice and uniformly because begonias need light to germinate. Those flats on the right-hand side, they came from the bottom of the car. When you had lack of uniform light, you got variation in the germination of the seed. So it's critical to get the light controlled as well. So, you know, one, if we take a look at, um, you know, sowing to radical emergence, it's a really about all about uniform moisture to get uniform germs and yields. And, and every day after you sow becomes a little less critical. The translation is every day after sow is really very important. So days time zero through 24, really important. 24 to 48, good, important. 48 to 72, a little less important. So if you're going to focus, let's make sure we got the focus of the moisture early on and that we're doing it correctly. One of the problems that we have is what, was, what we term as asynchronous germination, meaning all of the seeds don't germinate at the same time. The same time being that if you go and you look at from the first time the cotyledons unfold to the last cotyledon, it's about 48 hours. That is the window, 48 hour window from first cotyledon to the last, everything in that window is good. Everything outside of that window is basically going to be too delayed and it's going to be too small. So let's just talk about um, what are some of the things that causes asynchronous germination. The first is too wet. There's a lot of seeds, pansies, violas, um, salvias. Um, they all can form a gel coat. And this, you think about it, it's a way for the seed to stop germination so that it doesn't get into a position where it's trying to germinate in a swamp because these are plants that don't want to germinate in the swamp. So they actually get slimy, and that's because you've kept them too wet. You've seen this in waves, where all of a sudden pansies, they germinate, you get a group, and then a couple of days later, you get another group, and then a couple of days later, you get another group, and then you get another, that basically is telling me that you've been way too wet, then you got dry, boom, they germ, then you got wet, dry, wet, dry, and it's basically because of the gel coat preventing germination. If you're too dry, how do you know you're too dry, Todd? You know, if you can go look at it and you can see it, with the arrow, we've got pointed some of the, um, basically the pellets. If you still see pellets around and cotyledons, you probably are a little bit too dry during that first 24, 48 hours after sowing. So really think about upping your wet targets another 100 grams. Usually you move them about 100 grams at a time. 
What about buried seed? Well, you know, sometimes you want to bury the seed. You know, in the case of canna, it's a tropical plant. It's a swamp plant. You want to bury that seed so it gets wet, stays wet, so it can imbibe the water very well. Some other seed you don't want to bury because it's, you know, like begonias and impatiens, they're light requiring for germination. So don't bury them. You know, don't make sure that that wall of soil doesn't fall down on top of it. And then also make sure that your pellet is breaking down. Day zero, it should be mushy. Take the pencil, do a little pencil test, touch it, it should start crumbling. So that day one, it's just kind of mushy. Day two, it start opening up. Day three, you should have what we say a raisin in the oatmeal bowl so that you can actually see it opening up and sitting down in the middle of it, there should be a little black dot, which is the um, raisin or that is the seed. So making sure that you're not at day four and five, that those are still hard because those could be ball bearings and trust me, ball bearings <laughs> never turn into plants. So you really have to make sure that you're breaking down that pellet. Let's just talk about what happens once you've got the radical, the root has come out. Basically at that point is the signal to start drying back. Drop the, the dry target. So if you've been running a 900, a 1200, 900, 1200 um, wet dry targets, now that the radical has come out and has started to head down, you wanna start bringing that moisture down a little bit so that you basically bring the moisture target down just a little bit. Decrease that dry target because you want those roots to look for water. You want them to do it. If you're going to be putting on PGRs because you've got zinnias, you've got cosmos, you've got these big stretchers, now's the time as that rat, as that hypocotyl, which is a little stem that sticks above the soil, is starting elongator. That's when you start to having to um, worry about it. So let's talk, kind of sum it all up, Todd, and bring it home. Yeah, so let, let me go back and reiterate one more time this picture that we've got on the screen here. Um, this is a difference between 100 grams and a 512 or 288 flat, okay? So when you hear Will and I say you should really be watering by weight, measuring how much water's in here, this is why, 100 grams, that's not much, okay? There's, there's a big difference between success and not success in that picture. So very important at establishment stage, filling the flat, going through the watering tunnel before we get it on the bench. 100 grams is critical. What else is critical? Let's talk about applying that irrigation once we've got it out in the greenhouse maybe. So um, this is from one of our growers who helped us implement water by weight early on. Um, and there you can see their begonia seedlings. Now the graph is a little tilted on its side uh, for most of us to see, but yeah, in the beginning, this yellow fade, the one we have highlighted with the yellow bracket, the target on the, the line on the left was the dry down weight and then the weight and the line on the right was the water to weight. They were doing a really good job of keeping this soil nice and wet, but they were letting it dry down too far. Look down there as we get towards the bottom of that yellow bracket, they kept missing their weight. So those flats were drying out every few days and breaching and going beyond the, the optimum point for these begonias. And what did we get? It's not that we didn't get germination, we got it, it was just delayed. Now we've got a lack of uniformity in the crop. We're gonna spend the next several weeks, you know, playing with the PGRs, touching it just right, getting the feed a little higher, a little lower, trying to get this to create a more uniform flat. We've really just set ourselves back uh, a lot here and we're gonna have to work a lot harder to make this a great looking flat and ready to ship out. Yeah, so really focus during this stage one if you're doing nothing else than just stage one for um, water by weight. And we do have a, um, a real good um, webinar you can get off of the, um, that was produced and um, presented earlier in the month if you want to review that. Um, and just check the um, show notes for where you can find that. Because really, if we think about what we're trying to do is we're trying to set up our wet dry cycles, our, our target weights to really get that root to once it starts elongating to head to the bottom of the cell because we really want those roots at the bottom because if we have a water where we're maintaining a water level two at the top and a three at the bottom, we're gonna end up with a highly branched root system because it's forcing the roots to go out 
branch and find water. We want them working hard to find water. If we basically have, so we keep the tops wet, so we're misting all the time, we're keeping that top really too wet once the root starts elongating, we're basically going to end up with top horizontal roots wrapping around the top. They're lazy roots. They're not going to look for it because there's plenty of water there all the time, but they're not going to go down because if it's level two at the bottom, they're just not going to search out the roots. If we keep it wet, wet all the time, so it's a level four at the top and a level five at the bottom, you're going to end up with water roots and a very poor root. So if you've got a lot of poor roots, really review, are you taking it through a watering cycle where you're taking it up to a three and then you bring it to a five and up into a three, five, so you get roots all the way to the bottom. So I think that if you start thinking about what we've um, been hitting upon, let's just review the t key points, Todd. Yeah, well, hey, we made it through stage zero and stage one of uh, seed germination and plug production. So, uh, but we said we wanted to start strong. So starting strong, again, sanitation, it is critical. It doesn't matter what your crop is, you're gonna reduce your pest and disease problem. You're gonna have a better operation because of it. Uniform seed hydration. This starts at the bell buster and goes all the way through that stage one of germination, okay? We've got to get those, the soil perfect. We've got to get the right uniform moisture on the top of that flat from, you know, throughout that process, okay? And then, hey, we'll just topped and finished up managing the soil moisture for our goal to get roots to the bottom. That's using those wet dry cycles, okay? After we have germination, we need to be thinking about drying that soil down. And as well said, the three to five is a great way to uh, start for a lot of your plug crops. So, Will, with that, I think we covered stage zero and one. Uh, we need another couple of hours to <laughs> cover the rest of the stages maybe. I thought, uh, wow, you guys really uh, gave a good concise overview. Um, and, and I think that's attested by the fact that there are no questions in the Q&A besides a couple uh, people asking where they can find the slides for this presentation, which I will put in the video description of this video, a link to the slides. So if you want to go find the slideshow to share with your team, we will make sure that that's available. But I do want to thank you guys so much for the work that you put in on this presentation, as well as other topics in the Tech On Demand series. Um, you know, this is a topic that's relevant to so many growers. And uh, again, thank you for sharing such great information. I do want to uh, remind everybody that we do have uh, all of these videos archived at growertalks.com slash tech on demand. I will get this video produced and available hopefully by the end of the day today, um, certainly by tomorrow morning so that you can uh, review it and share back with your team. Also a reminder that this, this series does continue uh, throughout this month uh, with uh, many other great topics. Uh, we're going to tackle impatiens later this week. We're going to go into perennials and calibracoa next week, and we're going to wrap up with nutrition, fertilizer, and getting prepared for the season. That'll be our final live webinar. So until then, I do encourage you to go to growertalks.com slash tech on demand for all sorts of information. So again, Thank you so much for joining us today. That is a wrap. And on behalf of Will and Todd, I'm Bill Calkins with Ball Tech On Demand, wishing you a fantastic uh, wrap up to your fall season and a great start as you pre prepare getting ready for spring next year. So thank you very much, Todd and Will. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Thanks, Gary.